We're going to talk a lot about Jericho today. If you're having a seat there, turn back to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. And we will find ourselves still in the city of Jericho, but now we just backed up in time about 1,400 years to the day of the conquest. Just a little bit about Jericho that I found interesting this week, not to bore you to tears, but just a few interesting facts. Jericho is believed by many, many experts to be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. That doesn't mean it's the oldest city that ever existed. It means it's the oldest city that is continuously inhabited even to this day. Jericho is also because of its situation in the Jordan River Valley, just to the north and east of the upper end of the Dead Sea, is located at 800 feet below sea level, making it also the lowest <laughs> city in the world as far as in relation to sea level. Jericho, because of its situation, is lush with palm trees. In fact, in Scripture, it is referred to as the city of palms, fed by several natural springs there from the Jordan and from the uh, Dead Sea in that region. And uh, it is an oasis in the region. The modern city of Jericho is located in a plot of land today that we call the West Bank, controlled by Arabs and Palestinians just to the west of Jerusalem. Jericho is a city that you couldn't visit today uh, because it is a hostile place for the most part uh, due to its uh, uh, disputed nature there in the West Bank. Uh, the city of Jericho today has a population of about 14,000 people, meaning it's not a large city. But in Joshua's day, it is estimated that there were only about 2,500 or 3,000 people that lived there, which basically makes it the size of Seymour. <laughs> the city of Jericho. It's also one of the very first cities, historians tell us, to build a wall around itself for self-defense as a means of defending itself from attackers. Jericho appears many times in the Bible, the Old Testament, in the New Testament throughout. Many, many significant events took there, took place there, such as the story of Zacchaeus that we talked about, and many other things. But perhaps of all of them, the most well known is the story of Joshua and the Battle of Jericho that we find here in chapter six of this book. As I said a while ago, if you grew up in church, you probably have heard the story of Joshua and Jericho and the walls falling many, many times. But it's not just a kid's story. It's a story that has many powerful truths and insights that apply to Christians of all ages. And so as we look at the story today, I hope that God will speak to you afresh through this familiar tale that we have heard many times before, and that God will have some truths for us this morning. First point there on your outline is called the battle plan. The battle plan. We'll look at verses 1 through 5. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel, and no one went out, no one came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands with its king and all of its mountain warriors. You shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do, do so for six days. Also seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpet. And it shall be that when they make a long blast of the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight ahead. If you look at the very first verse of this chapter, it becomes very apparent that the citizens of Jericho were very, very aware of the Israel, Israelites' presence. We've been talking about, since the beginning of this book, 
the Hebrew children crossing the Jordan River and the waters parted. The spies that came prior to even that in the city and how the report was that the people of the city were aware of the Israelites being there and that they were terrified because of their presence and because of the reputation that they had and the things that Jehovah God had done on their behalf throughout the Exodus. Now they've crossed the Jordan River and they are literally camped just a couple of miles away. And the people of Jericho are very, very aware and very, very concerned about the Israelites' presence. And they are anticipating that an attack is imminent. And as a result, we see in verse 1 that they have closed the city. The gates are closed. It's been shut. And they are preparing to defend the city as best that they can against this massive Israelite army, the army of God. It says here that the Lord spoke to Joshua and assured Joshua again that the Lord had given him the city. You remember when the spies went and saw Rahab and heard from her how all the people of Canaan were fearful and terrified. They came back to Joshua and they, they reported to Joshua, surely God has given us the city. And now we see again the Lord telling Joshua and confirming yet again that the city is yours for the taking and with it the beginning of the conquest that will take the next several years. So it begins right here at Jericho. And the Lord gives Joshua a battle plan or a strategy for attack. As we read through this, it strikes, strikes us as kind of an unconventional battle plan. Does it not? The battle plan is, is this. You should take all the men of war along with the priests, blowing seven trumpets of ram's horns, not metal trumpets, but ram's horns, and the Ark of the Covenant, and all of you in a procession, all of the people to march around the city once each day for six consecutive days. And then on the seventh day, you're to march around the city of Jericho seven times as the foot priests are blowing their trumpets. And when you can finish the, the final lap around the city, the priests were to blow a, a long trumpet blast. And when the people heard the long blast, it would be a signal and they were to shout, a great shout. And at this point, the Lord stated to Joshua that the walls of Jericho would fall down and the armies of Israel were to invade the city. Now, verses 1 through 5 of this chapter are generally seen as a continuation of the last few verses of chapter 5. So if you remember from last week's sermon, Joshua was near the city of Jericho, Verse 13 of chapter 5. When the army of the commander of the Lord appeared to him with a sword drawn and began to speak to him. We said last week that there is debate among theologians about the exact identity of this captain of the Lord's army. Perhaps it was an angel, maybe even an archangel, or perhaps some have uh, surmised that it was Jesus himself, a pre incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. But whether through an angel or whether through Jesus himself, the Lord is speaking and that speaking continues at the beginning of chapter 6. And the Lord gives Joshua this unconventional battle plan. Seems somewhat bizarre. Now again, I don't want to belabor the point that I made last week, but just to remind you, Joshua was a military 
military person. And certainly, based on his track record of success, he knew what he was doing. And there's no question in my mind that Joshua had likely <laughs> developed a plan of attack and had a strategy in mind for attacking the city. He wasn't just going to uh, invade willy-nilly or lay siege on him without a plan. And so when God showed up with this plan, not only did Joshua endeavor to obey it, but he did so despite the fact that it seemed strange. There, there's a lesson there for us as Christians. And I think it's a timely lesson for us as well. The Lord calls us to be a peculiar people. Which means, you know, the world might look at us funny. Are we willing to be peculiar for the Lord? Sometimes the answer is no. Look at the way the church, and I'm not talking about Calvary per se, but just the church in general. Look at the way the church has acquiesced to and tried to adopt the culture over the last 50 years so that we might look more like the world. No, no. I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that, that all the churches have sacrificed their beliefs or are, are sacrificed what they hold dear, but, but they've changed their approaches and their strategies, and they've kind of taken the Bible and dressed it in modern clothes so that it might look like the world, because we don't want to seem strange. We don't want to seem weird. Are we willing to be weird for Jesus? Joshua knew how to do this the conventional way. <laughs> but God called him strange. And he said, I'll be strange for you, Jesus. I'll be strange for you, Lord. That's what you're calling me. I think there's a lesson there for us today. Here's what the Lord said. If you'll do it, I assure you, I'll give you the city. And so let's continue. Verse 6. The second point this morning is called Days 1 through 6. <laughs> Days 1 through 6. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant. And let seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And the people, and then he said to the people, Go forward and march around the city, and let the armed men go before the ark of the Lord. And it was so. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the Lord went forward and blew the trumpet. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpet, and the rear guard came after the ark while they continued to blow the trumpet. So Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I tell you, shout. Then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once. Then they went, came to the camp and spent the night in the camp. Now Joshua rose early in the morning and the priests took up the ark of the Lord and the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets and the armed men went before them and the rear guard came behind them while they continued to blow the trumpets. Thus the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp and they did so for six days. As we break this, these verses down just a little bit, we see that after Joshua received God's command and his instruction, he 
gathered all the people together. He summoned the priests, he summoned the people, the, the uh, warriors, the military men, and all of, all of the people. And he carefully went through and laid out God's instructions for them. I can't help but think that there were people as they were listening that kind of shared the same natural response that Joshua must have had, which is, <laughs> this seems a bit peculiar. Joshua, you know, we just, just you know, months, of, months ago, maybe a year ago or so, we were on the other side of the Jordan and we were fighting against the Moabites and we were fighting against you know, the Ammonites, and, and I don't remember this strategy. It was more conventional warfare. This, this seems kind of bizarre. But nevertheless, Joshua laid out the plan. People respected Joshua because they knew he was a man of God. They had seen his success in the past, and they trusted him, and as a result, they fell in line accordingly and they trusted that Joshua's plan was of God. It was the will of God and therefore they obeyed and they followed they, I'm sorry, they formed a procession and they put an armed group in the front, armed men in the front of the, the line and then followed behind that somewhere there in the middle were seven priests blowing these seven trumpets of ram's horns and immediately behind the priest came those that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, presumably the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant or perhaps other priests also from the tribe of Levi carrying the Ark of the Covenant and then following the Ark of the Covenant was another armed guard and those that followed in the rear. Of course the Ark of the Covenant as we've talked about previously when they crossed the Jordan River, representing the manifest presence of God Himself. And Joshua told the people, I find this to be kind of a, an interesting, to be absolutely quiet, not to make a noise as they marched around the city, not to let any, any words or any sound come out of their mouth at all. So that the, only, the only sound would be that of the trumpets that were blasting. Now, I'm just going to tell you, if that many people actually marched around the city once each day for six days, and then seven, and they didn't make any noise at all, that that alone is a miracle. <laughs> I used to teach school, as y'all know, years ago. I was a third grade teacher when I graduated college. I went to work teaching third grade at, at Swinburne Elementary School in Tulia, Texas. And I can tell you, when we lined up to go to the library, or when we lined up to go to the cafeteria, or when we lined up to go to the bathroom, which was just right down the hall, and I told the kids, okay, everybody be quiet. Don't make a sound. We didn't even get out of the classroom before there was noise. And we'd be walking down the hall, and these kids would be talking up, and like, shut, shut, shut. And we'd be going down, and here comes another teacher the other way, and all the kids would be the perfect line, very quiet. And I, I thought, man, I, I'm terrible at this job. I'm awful. For them to walk around and not make a sound, that had to be eerie. It had to be just kind of unsettling. The whole thing was just weird. And so in this manner, as we read, people lined up, they approached the city of Jericho, they got up early in the morning, they marched to it, trumpets blasting, they marched around it, and then they went back home. Now, you know, when you really start to sit and process this, that seems weird, but think about this. They did that every day for six days in a row.
the tactic must have seemed odd at best and perhaps foolish to the defenders of Jericho. They were expecting something totally different. They were expecting Israel to come and lay siege upon their city, to surround it, to bombard it, to try to overrun its defenses, to try to lay siege ramps against it, and to either uh, breach its walls or bring down its walls. And yet for six days in a row, the Israelites came, marched peacefully and quietly around the city, with the exception of the ram's horns that were blasting, and then quietly and peacefully walked back to camp. And i got to tell you, as the people of Jericho watched this happening from atop their mighty wall, surely some of them thought to themselves, what are these people doing? And again, to think back to what I was saying a while ago, perhaps some of the Hebrews themselves thought, what are we doing? Maybe the people of Jericho thought that it was some type of a perhaps psychological warfare to try to get in their head and freak them out. To try to scare them to death before the actual invasion began because it was like, this is weird. And then tomorrow, again, this is kind of creepy. What are these guys doing? But then there might have been others who responded by, what idiots! They really think this is going to work? I really thought that, you know, based on the reputation, they'd bring more to the table than this. This is kind of pathetic. And there were certainly doubters in Jericho who chastised and ridiculed the people as they marched around. I, I would ask you if, you, if you're able to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14, where Paul wrote to the Corinthians, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually afraid. In the opening chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about this idea that the wisdom of God is, is, doesn't make sense to men, it's foolishness to men. They, they, the natural man can't understand it. It seems weird. It seems strange. And I think this story gives us a tangible example of this principle. And how sometimes the things of God appear ridiculous to the world. And they don't make sense to the world. And yet, it's what God called them to do. And as we read through the rest of the chapter, it's God's will and God's plan. And ultimately, God is right and the world is wrong. It's reminiscent of when Noah came to the folks in his day and said, It's going to rain and flood. And they looked at him and said, You're an idiot. But when the rain started falling, they changed their mind, didn't they? Let's look at. Verse 15 and following. I call this third point, day seven. Then on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day did they march around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban, and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab out the harlot, and all who are with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban, so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban, and make the camp of Israel a curse or bring trouble on it. 
And all the silver and gold articles and the bronze and the iron are holy to the Lord, and they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, and when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat. So the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. So on the seventh day, to reiterate what we've read here, the children of Israel once again got up early in the morning and they lined up in their procession in the proper order as God instructed and they marched their way to the city of Jericho again. And on the seventh day, they went around the sea seven times. Now, it took a while. Think about it. If it's roughly the size of Seymour, it would take a little while to march around the city once, much less seven times. Perhaps most of the day. But when they finally completed their last, last lap, Joshua commanded them to shout. But he also gave them more instructions that we look at here. Joshua told them that the entire city, the entire city and all of its possessions, and all of its people were designated by God for destruction. It was designated for destruction, and the tangible things, the articles, were under a ban for God alone. Only right at the prostitute and those in our house were to be spared. And of course, we were introduced to Rahab back in chapter 2 when the spies came to the city to scout her out and she hid them there in her home, which would have been just a few weeks earlier to the events we're discussing this morning. All the gold, all the silver, all the precious articles there found in the city of Jericho were to be taken and placed into the treasury of the Lord. By the way, I don't know if you caught this a while ago, but when Janice was reading John, uh, John chapter 8, there was a men mention of the treasury of the temple where they kept these type of items and things that were donated and money that were donated to the temple and to the house of God to maintain it and to uh, even compensate uh, the priests and those who were there for their service. The treasury of the Lord would be where all of these things were placed. None of it was to be taken. None of the spoils were to be kept by any of the individual people. The entire city being the first one of the conquest, the first fruits, if you will, of the conquest was to be given to the Lord. And so, in obedience to these instructions, the Israelites, having circled the city seven times, shouted with a great shout. <laughs> and the walls of Jericho miraculously collapsed. God caused the walls to crumble and fall. Now, I always put a little caveat here for those critics who jump in and say, well, didn't you say that rain up lifted the walls? Well, common sense would dictate that the limited area around Rahab's house did not collapse. But that one little sliver of the wall was all that didn't collapse. The rest of it did. Thereby making the invasion easy. And I bet the citizens of Jericho weren't laughing at this point. At the peculiar nature of Joshua's battle plan. They shouted and the walls fell, and immediately, in obedience to the Lord's command, the Hebrew army rushed into the city and killed all of its inhabitants. It was a complete annihilation. They killed the men, they killed the women, they killed young, they killed old, they killed dock, donkey, ox, sheep, every living thing. They killed people, they killed the animals, they killed everything that had bread that was in Jericho. They killed it all. Apart from Rahab and those who were sheltered in her in her house, as marked with the red cord in her window, apart from her and those 
within our home it was a complete and utter destruction. This was the beginning of God's judgment on Canaan. Remember we talked about just last week. Not only was these not only were these things happening, the yes, I say as a means of God giving the land to Israel, but they were also a means of punishment on Canaan. For centuries of disobedience and uh, pagan uh, activities and, and sinful wickedness. But as we look at this story, and not only this story, but others in Scripture that are like this story, there are those out there, adversaries of God and enemies of Scripture, who see stories like this one and the slaughter of Jericho citizens as an indication of God's cruelty and his excessive ruthlessness. And these non-believers use stories like this and perceive stories like this as reasons to despise God and to try to distance themselves from him and to slander in him and to malign his character as again cruel and, and, and vengeful and hateful. But I would counter that argument by saying, what about Rahab? Rahab was a citizen of Jericho, just like the rest of them. Jericho, I mean, I'm sorry, Rahab didn't have a godly upbringing, just like the rest of them. And what's more, if you go back to chapter 2 and you look, it wasn't the scouts who shared their faith with Rahab. If you remember, when the scouts came, Rahab hid them, and Rahab was the one who initiated the conversation and said, I have heard of the reputation of Israel and how your God parted the Red Sea for you to cross and how your God has given you victory over the various nations beyond the Jordan River. And I have come to a faith and a belief that your God, Jehovah, the God of Israel, is the true and living God. And what more, she said, and all of the people in the land have heard these same things and they're terrified. But here's the difference. She heard these things and believed. The rest of them heard these things and didn't believe. They remained in disbelief. They may have been terrified, but they did not place their faith in Jehovah God. They did not trust in Jehovah God. They did not turn from their idolatry and their wickedness. I, I am reminded of the story of Jonah. When Jonah came to the city of Nineveh, it was a wicked city. And you remember Jonah's gospel message? Jonah's gospel message was, you're all going to die in 40 days. That, that was his message. Judgment's, judgment's coming. Doesn't, doesn't seem like a, a very good presentation of, of any evangelistic uh, strategy I've ever known. But what's the difference? Well, the difference is the king of Jericho sent out men to try to find the spies and seize them and made no effort to repent or bring a city to repentance. Whereas the king of Nineveh, many years later, called the city and they all repented. And the city was spared. Even at Jonah's chagrin, the city was spared. God is an awful, horrible God. Look what he did to the citizens of Jericho. Beloved, those citizens had the same opportunity that Rahab had. She and her family were spared. They were saved because of their faith. Because they changed. They repented. How this story might have been different if the people of Jericho had responded in whole like Rahab did. Beloved, is God wrathful? Yes. The Bible says that we need to be very fearful of the wrath of God. Is the Lord vengeful? Yes. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, declares the Lord. But is the Lord cruel and 
mean and hateful. No. He afforded these people opportunities to repent. Ray right as an example. But as I've said before, and I'll say again, God is just. God is just. And he will not allow unrepentant sin to continue and continue and continue without judgment. And so the city was taken. So let's read the final verses of this chapter. I call this last point after the battle. After the battle. And we're in verse 22. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the harlot's house and bring the woman out and all that she had out of there that she had sworn to her. So the young men went, who were spies, went in and brought Rahab and her father and mother and all the brothers, all that they had, and they brought up all the relatives and placed them outside of the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire, all that was in it. Only the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. However, Rahab the harlot and all her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. For she has hid the messengers whom Joshua sent out, sent to spy out Jericho. Then Joshua made them take oath at that time, saying, Curse it before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds the city Jericho with the loss of its first point each way of salvation, with the loss of his youngest, he shall set up his gate. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. As we wrap up this chapter, we see here that after the onslaught was complete, the spies went to Rahab's house that had been a safe haven shelter during the midst of all the battle that was taking place around it. And they escorted her and her family safely outside of the city. They took them outside to the outside outskirts of the city and then as you put this together they went throughout all of the houses and the buildings various structures that were there in jericho and one by one systematically went through them they collected all the gold all the silver all the other precious articles that they could find and they placed all of these things into the treasury of war and after Rahab has been safely removed and her family, and after all of the treasury, treasures have been taken, everything else in the city, in the city itself, was set aside. They raised the city. That's raised with a Z. It's a destroying the city. Burning it with fire as a complete destruction and as a sacrifice to the Lord. But not only that, not only did they destroy the city, but it goes on. In the closing verses of the chapter, we see that Joshua made the people take an oath. And I'll paraphrase what he said, but basically he said, Cursed is the person who rebuilds Jericho. Whoever raises up this city again will suffer the loss of both his oldest and his youngest son. Pretty, pretty stiff uh, curse. And with this, the battle of Jericho and the subsequent destruction of the city was finished. A couple of things that I would point out there quickly. First of all, notice that the writer at the time that they wrote this, which would have been sometime after the battle actually took place, mentions that Rahab and her descendants continue to live among the Israelites even to this day. Even after the conquest of Canaan was complete, Rahab and her family still lived in and amongst the people of Israel and adopted their God, Jehovah God, for their family and for the generations that follow. I think about how in the New Testament it talks about how the Gentiles were grafted in. Well, Rahab is kind of a picture of this, an early picture of how 
Rahab, though a Gentile, and her family were grafted in and lived among and accepted and were believers among the Jews even in these early, early centuries. Also, we read here that in the centuries that followed, Jericho remained an uninhabited, ruinous heap of rubble. It had been destroyed, its walls had fallen, and it had been burned, and it was just ruined. And for several hundred years, it just sat there in a, in a pot. <laughs> and I'm sure it was a chilling reminder to both, is to both Israel and to her enemies. A testimony to God's strength and His power. It's interesting. Scripture records that over 500 years later, during the, king of, during the reign of King Ahab in the northern kingdom of the northern kingdom of Israel in 1 Kings chapter 16 verse 34 it records that a man during this time named Hiel who was obviously a builder decided it was time after 500 plus years to rebuild the city of Jericho and during the construction according to this verse in 1 Kings Hiel's firstborn son and youngest son died just as the Lord's curse had declared would happen. Since Hiel rebuilt Jericho, the current city of Jericho sits um, just south of where the ancient city once sat, and in fact it's grown large enough that it kind of encompasses some of the old city ruins or what uh, has been ex excavated there, but uh, it was repopulated. So like I said at the outside, at, at the outset, it's be believed to be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. But there was a period of centuries there for about 500 years that it was empty until it was rebuilt. Well, as I conclude this morning, I would just say that as is the case with many other uh, biblical stories, Modern excavations within the last 100, 150 years have served to support the truthfulness of this account. Just as we talk about in our series through Exodus and in other places throughout our studies, we have seen how modern discoveries, archaeological discoveries, have not have not thwarted or 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 uh, uh, made the biblical account seem unfeasible, but it in fact have served to support the truthfulness of the biblical account. In other words, we can trust that these stories aren't just made up myths or legends told to inspire the nation. Archaeologists have discovered in the layers of the ancient city's ruins there at the site of biblical Jericho that there was in fact a wall around Jericho during this time period. And the discoveries uh, show that it appears to have been made of mud and stone and that it represent, that it rested, I'm sorry, on a smaller retaining wall that was at ground level. So they had this sloping retaining wall and then the high arching wall of the city. Not only that, but the discoveries have shown that the wall seemed to be 14 feet thick. In other words, there was a wall and an interior wall in which houses could have been built, small apartments, such as Greyhead's apartment, between the two walls. This, this has been actually found by archaeologists in these ruins. What's more, based on the way that they have discovered it and how things are laid out, the, in, the findings indicate that this wall did indeed collapse and it collapsed outward. Not necessarily straight down, but outward, thereby forming a natural ramp, siege ramp, upon which an invading army could easily just come right up the ramp into the city. Listen, beloved, 
The Bible was not written primarily to be a history book. In the same way, it wasn't written primarily to be a science book either. But I can tell you with certainty that the history and the science <laughs> that we find in the Bible is accurate. It is 100% true. One final observation, and I'm done this morning. The, ba the Battle of Jericho vividly demonstrates the relationship between faith and works. In James, we find the, the concept that faith without works is dead. When God tells us what to do, we need to do it. We need to put our belief into action. And that's there on your outline there at the bottom. Faith is belief in action. Yes. Belief alone is not enough, nor are works alone. Faith combines both of these, thereby proving our beliefs and, let me see here, I've got the word, and by and through our deeds. Just saying you believe in God and not acting on it is not sufficient. Working and working and working, but having no belief is not sufficient. Faith combines both of these elements in one. Faith without works is dead. In other words, it's no good. Faith is belief in action. Even when that may seem strange. God told the Israelites to go march around the city. And they didn't just sit in the camp and say, we believe the walls are going to fall. We believe the walls are going to fall. We believe the no, they got up and, and they did. And they worked and they obeyed. And as a result of their faithful obedience, because their faith was put into action, it was proof of a genuine faith. Then God, by His power and by His grace, caused the walls to tumble down. And the application for us today is that we might have the same type of saving faith. That we would take what we believe and we would act on it so as to prove our belief by the things that we do and the things that we say. Not that works will save us, but that works acting in correspondence with our beliefs will prove to be a saving faith. May we demonstrate that type of faith today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this story. Lord, that we've heard many times over the years. Lord, thank you for the powerful truth that it gives to us. Lord, I pray that we would have the same level of faith that these Israelites did. That we would be willing to obey your commands wherever they may take us and however strange they may be in the eyes of the world. God, that we would be comfortable being peculiar. <laughs> Lord, that we'd be okay to be different and that we wouldn't try to uh, acquiesce to the culture or to the way the world by sacrificing things, the things of God. Lord, help us to have a faith, Lord, that obeys. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus said. Help us to be obedient so that the things that we do and say confirm and prove the things that we believe. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today who has any decision to make during this free presentation, Lord, they would do so in accordance to your will. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to